Hello folks, how do you think you'd machine this? So following on from our video on how to machine a distro plate, I thought it'd be good fun to have a bit of a challenge. In this case, it's making a little star-shaped nebula. So why is this difficult to machine? Well, it might be because it's got double-sided machining on not only the front, but also the back. Or it could be the fact that it has no completely flat sides to it and no ability to make a reference point. So if you're going to be doing the double-sided work, you're going to have to figure out how to do that without using any of the parts on this itself. Now the main bulk of this is from a round sort of corner fillet that I've put around the entire outside of the star on both the top and the bottom. It also has a recessed port in the middle, so that's the fill port, the G1 quarter port inside of that, and it's got counterboard screws. So you've got to make sure that you do your counterboring from the back on that. You can't just do it on one side and then hope to do it on, this, on a machine afterwards without some special bits. Of course, what makes it extra difficult is you also have to do a 3D piece on the inside because I've made the interior corners curved as well. And that includes the recessed area because you're not going to have enough space otherwise to put your G1 core to stop plug in. So that has to be recessed from the back and it has a nice curve on the inside to make it a little bit different and it hasn't got the same radius on the outside. So I'd be very interested to see how the uh, amateur machinists amongst you and maybe professionals would tackle a piece like this. So if you want to give this a try, you can find in the description a GrabCAD link to this step file for this particular project, but it won't contain any of the data for doing the actual toolpath thing. You're going to have to do that yourself. Now I'm also going to be showing you how I did it in a few seconds, so if you don't want to spoil it for yourself, you best turn away now. So let's rewind time a little bit, pop the material on the machine, and see how I actually did this. So starting off with OP1, we're going to begin by using a 3.1mm, 21mm flute length drill. And this is going to be doing all the roughing work for the thread milling later on. Second tool, we're using a 4.1mm drill and this is going to be making the full size holes that are going to be on the opposite side of the distro plate, opposite the threads. Next up, we're going to cut the threads using one of these, which is an M4-5 to thread mill cutter. Now what this is going to be doing is going over the 3.1mm holes that we drilled earlier, and then just putting the threads into the outside. Now 3.1mm is below the minimum wall of a M4 thread, which means this is going to be cutting all the way down, but with most of the material removed, we're not going to have any problems with the material melting around the bit. Now we're going to be doing the pocket cuts, and to do that, I'm using a 6mm 4-in-1 end mill from Datron. I'm running it at 1000 mm per minute at 20,000 RPM. And I'm going to be using a 0.5 to 1 mm depth of cut, not because it can't go deeper, but because I want to have a scallop, because I'm using a 3D adaptive toolpath on this one. So I want to try and make sure that I'm only taking up very, very shallow passes to make it easier on the later tools. Now comes the fun stuff. We're going to be using one of these, which is a 3 mm ball end mill with a polished cut edge to be able to do all the 3D sculpting. I'm going to be using a contour toolpath using a rough step over of 0.5mm for the roughing work and then I'm going to drop that down to 0.2mm again using a contour and then finishing up with a horizontal along the bottom and that will give a really lovely smooth finish. With the interior cut we now need to focus on doing the o-rings so to do this I'm going to be using one of these which is a 2mm single flute polished edge end mill from Datron again. I'm going to be running this one twice, first doing it at 0.5mm depth and then later doing it at full depth. The reason I'm doing this is because I want to double check the cutting depth all around the o-ring groove because sometimes the material is not flat and I need to be able to account for that. Last job for OP1 is this, which is an 8mm countersink and that's going to be going around the edges of the recessed port on the inside. Now it's time to flip the part. And usually, you'd probably want to indicate off an existing part. But given that we've got no straight edges and it's going to be very difficult to work out exactly where this part is, instead what I've done is I haven't cut them out. I've left them in the original piece of acrylic, and I'm going to flip that by using some locating pins that I've measured already and put into the CAD drawing, just so that I know exactly where on my bed the piece is sitting. So by putting it on some known coordinates that are already on my machine, I can then do the double-sided work without having any difficulties. Now 
Now since we're going to be doing a lot of contour work on the top, we're going to start with this, which is another 6mm cutter, and that's going to be cutting around the edge using a 2D contour and also doing all of the counterbores. Now I don't want to cut all the way to the bottom, so what I've done is I've used a 0.2mm stock to leave around the outside so that I can do a finish pass later on, and I've left 1mm stock to leave on the base so that it doesn't get completely cut out from the plastic. With the outer contour cut, now it's time to do the contour work on the outside using the 3mm ball end mill again. So what I've done is I've used a contour once around the outside at a 0.5mm step over again, and then I'm going over once more with a 0.2mm step over. Now, to be able to avoid doing all of the recesses that you find in the counterbores, what I did is I actually removed them from the CAD drawing, and then I used the patch command to cover up the screw holes. Now what that does is it stops the tool from going around all of the interior edges, which would add a heck of a lot of extra toolpath time, and also make it a very messy cut. So there's a good chance that if it was doing that, the machine would be shaking, vibrating, and it wouldn't leave a nice polished finish. By using the patch command, it makes the whole geometry much, much simpler, and it's much better for the contour algorithm to get a nice smooth finish. With the outer contour milling done, it's time to do some chamfers, and we're going to be using the 8mm polished cut chamfer mill once more. We're going to add a chamfer around the inside of the G1 quarter recessed port area, as well as a small one that goes on the keychain section. As before, I'm running this at 1000 millimeters per minute, and I'm also adding a spring pass just to clean up any tool deflection or difficulties that it may have with the acrylic. Whilst it won't really deflect much in the acrylic, I find adding a spring pass just cleans up that little bit extra room that may have come from vibration from the actual part or the tool itself. Finally, the last thing we need to do is cut the parts out of the stock itself. And to do that, we're going to go back to the 6mm 4-in-1 single flute end mill. Now, remember we left some stock to leave around the outside last time. We're now going to set that to zero, and that means it's only going to be taking 0.2mm around the outside. Now what that does is it leaves a very smooth, clear, polished cut all around the outside of the part, which is exactly what we're looking for. The next step is we're going to go around it again, but this time with a 0.4mm axial stock to leave. Now the point of this is just to reduce it and make it a little bit thinner, because if you go all the way through in one go, sure, it's fine, you can do it, it can handle the cut no problem, but your part might end up chattering or vibrating because at some point it's going to be having a lot of lateral forces still exerted on it, but with very little holding it to the bed. Now I've put a little bit of double-sided sellotape on the, on the back of mine to help keep things nicely held, but there's every chance that that's on maybe a poor piece of the bed or some kind of ridge. So to get around that, I go down first into the 0.4mm, and then I do a final finish pass at full depth, because cutting at 0.4mm is much less stressful than cutting at 1mm. So as mentioned, we now do the final pass, which is at 0, 0 in terms of stock to leave, and this will cut the part out completely. Now if you've measured correctly, you should just be able to cut on top of the backing material of the acrylic, but if you've removed it already, it's important to make sure that you hold onto the part somehow Otherwise, it can very easily go flying when you're still doing the cutting or if it gets pushed around by your air nozzle. The last step now is to put the block together. So for that, we're going to be first making a custom length O-ring. Now we did a video on how to do this, which you can find in the card above. And then we're also going to be using the screws, which in my case are 10 millimeter socket caps. We're going to just basically glue the O-ring together put it into the groove, and then give everything just a little once over with a cloth just to clean off any of the other residual coolant and other materials from the machining. It should, in the theory holds true, be basically completely polished cut straight off the machine. Now I hope you found that interesting folks. I'll be really excited to see who decides to give this a go and what your results are going to be. Of course, if you're new to the channel, we have plenty of CNC content like this present here, along with crazy rigs that we're going to be building, modding, hardware reviews, and all sorts of other things as well. So make sure you subscribe, and also don't forget to leave us a comment. You can also find us over on Discord, builds.gg, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll catch you later, folks.